Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that nutrition during pregnancy and up to age five is shown to have really significant impacts on children's behavioral and emotional health. Uh, and the reason I want this to be our cool fact of the day today is that it's pretty shocking to me when I go to restaurants, they have a kid's menu. And frankly, that's stuff that I wouldn't feed to my dog uh, because it would cause my dog to be inflamed and have food cravings just like it does to children. And this data is coming from a nine-year Norwegian mother and child cohort study of 23,000 women and their kids. And they collected data during pregnancy when the kids were six months, one and a half, three and five years of age. And they basically did some really careful math analysis to say the diet was, quote, healthy or, quote, unhealthy. In other words, they weren't saying this is testing paleo versus, you know, semi-whatever. And this was basically, are you eating like crap? Are you not eating like crap? <laughs> and they found higher intakes of unhealthy foods during pregnancy meant what they called externalizing problems among children independent of other potential factors uh, like their family health and things like that. Children with a, a high and healthy diet had uh, both problems with the space of the voice in their head, their internalizing problems and their externalizing problems. And they had the same effect whether it was during pregnancy or whether it was post-pregnancy. And this is a really big study that came out. So what this comes down to is if you're going to spend money on quality food, feed it to <laughs> pregnant women and babies first. And if we just get that right, everything gets easier for that entire generation. And that's a, that's a really important thing. I like to look at what I do for health and what specifically I do for nutrition. It has a ROI, return on investment. And the investment is how much does it cost and how much energy uh, did it take to make the food you know, for you to, to for you to take your own energy to make the food and how much energy did it take to eat it because eating things like raw kale actually doesn't feel good. It's not something that that usually uh, makes you happy, but you do it because it makes you know you'll be healthier or at least you think you will if you do it. So that's what the investment is and what's the return? Do I feel good now? But when return is measured in an entire lifetime change for a human being, that's just an absurdly high return. And that's why you feed kids the best food and the adults get the scraps, even though throughout history, it's been the adults eat the best food and we give kids the scraps. It's just backwards. Now, you might, uh, you might know uh, because of my incredibly predictable habit of foreshadowing that we might be talking about nutrition and we might be talking about health uh, of, uh, of children uh, as well as you know, with, with adults, uh, in this case with uh, uh, just a, a luminary in the field, an international speaker on brain chemistry and behavior, on learning and mental health disorders, and uh, a guy who spent three decades as a research scientist and engineer looking at how you can fix brains, even brains with bipolar disorder, using nutrients and foods. He's an episode, or he's a, a he's been on episode 132 of Bulletproof Radio, and a man I just genuinely respect as someone who's gone really deep on the science and spent a lifetime learning how to get control of your own biochemistry. And we're talking about none other than Dr. Bill Walsh of the Walsh Research Institute. Bill, welcome back to Bulletproof Radio. Well, hi, Dave. Glad to be with you. Last time you came on the show, we talked about Nutrient Power, uh, your most recent book that talked about things like methylation and biochemical imbalances. Uh, but that was about 400 episodes ago. <laughs> that was, yes. And you've been continuing to do your work, um, really an incredible work on nutrients. And you've, I think, discovered some new things or maybe just had more clarity on things around uh, some of the more difficult to treat and scary things like bipolar disorder. I would love to know uh, what what have you discovered since we last talked? Well, uh, let me first talk a little bit about what you were just speaking about, uh, namely what one can do with diet for pregnant women and, and early in early childhood. Um, there have been some studies that other studies that have just recently come out of the psychiatric research field 
uh, one I read just last week, and they have actually done studies of, of what foods can uh, tend to help with cognition and physical ability and which ones can tend to make you pre predispose you to mental disorders. And there were some surprises there. Uh, they, they, they found out uh, that, you know, things like vitamin D and zinc and other things that tended to strengthen the brain in many ways. But they found some pretty important nutrients that actually could predispose to problems like schizophrenia. Oh, interesting. It's very interesting. And, uh, and, and so we're learning more and more uh, about what we can do to help, help the, uh, the, the, the newborns become more capable and have a better life. Um, one thing that's especially important is what, what, uh, the mothers do before they're pregnant. Yes. One thing we've learned is that the critical time during the nine months of gestation is between days 16 and 22 of gestation. And that's before many women even know they're pregnant. I know when my wife had her first child, she, she didn't want to be around anybody that was smoking. She, or she stopped drinking alcohol. She was a nurse, so she was pretty healthy to begin with. But, you know, it was too late for many things. Uh, really, they have to be healthy before that critical time in gestation. It's, it's when the neural tube closes. So um, I, I, I think that, and also they, they, there's many studies that show that diet during pregnancy means so much. And, and even in early, in the first few years, um, so you're right about the ROI and the return on investment, and it's just something that is just critically important. Um, but what, since, since we last talked, which was a really long time ago, uh, we have learned a lot. Neuroscience advances, and my, my interest has always been on the brain and on people with brain disorders, depression, anxiety, autism, schizophrenia, the whole litany of brain science. And um, my, my focus has to, work, has to be on the neurotransmitters themselves. And uh, there are about more than 100 neurotransmitters in the brain, uh, of which there are about five or six that seem to be especially important in, in mental disorders. And um, we all have biochemical individuality, as you know, and uh, we are born different. In a sense, we're all mutants. Um, we, <laughs> are, we, sh we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA but it's that tenth of a percent, the, the, the ways in which we're different, these mutations or, or, or differences in gene expression that have come up over, over centuries and millennia that really make us different. We're, we're now learning uh, so much about uh, what, what we can do. We've now learned that for the first time in the last 10 years, we now are able with nutrients to, to directly affect neurotransmission of many of the most important neurotransmitters. For example, with, with, um, with serotonin, we know that people with low serotonin activity are prone and predisposed to depression and, and obsessive compulsive disorder and a few other nasty problems. Uh, we, we now are learning that uh, for years people thought, hey, what you really need to do if you're low in serotonin is, is get tryptophan and, and take nutrients that help you synthesize the neurotransmitters. Well, it turns out that's not a bad idea, but really the, the, dominant, the dominant factor is reuptake. The rate at which your, 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 your serotonin in the synapse goes back into the original neuron. It's called reuptake. And, and uh, we now, with the advent of epigenetics and knowledge, we now can tailor neurotransmission with nutrients. And we're really quite good at that for for serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. But what's really new is the recent research on the NMDA receptor. That whole system, that's where memory exists. And that's where, and that's where um, people who have uh, problems with their NMDA are the ones who are, are, are prone to addictions and obsessive compulsive disorder. We, uh, for many years, for more than 25 years, we discouraged uh, drug addicts like cocaine addicts uh, and heroin um, people who were abusing alcohol or alcohol or these substances, uh, we discourage them from coming to the clinic. We now know we now because of advanced science, we now know how we can help them, and uh, and it all has to do with the NMDA. If they they that particular group of people, uh, they 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 need to reduce the activity of that neurotransmitter. 
And guess what works the best? People have been trying for years to find a billion dollar drug that would really help them. They're finding that there are nutrients that seem to be far better than that. And this is in peer reviewed journals, things like N-acetylcysteine, for example. <laughs> Um, they're finding this is a, this is a long standing nutrient that everyone in anti-aging has used for 25 years to raise glutathione levels in the body, which, which is profound. They're figuring out, oh yeah, it helps the brain of addicts too. Well, we thought that the reason that, that N-acetylcysteine, uh, or ca called NAC, uh, is helping these people was because of the, the, it's a precursor of glutathione and because it's a great antioxidant itself, but there's something else we now know it's something called an anti-porter. What happens is it, it has a unique capability to lower NMDA activity. And, and we now know the exact, and it's a very, it's a very beautiful, uh, uh, you might say, system and mechanism by which it works. It, it works on the glial cells that surround neurons. And it, 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 it acts as what's known as an anti-porter. It shoves cysteine into the, into the, into the glial cells and, and shoves glutamate into the synapse. Well, you would think that would increase activity, but it doesn't. It, acts on, it, it actually shuts down and lowers the activity. And what they're finding is even, even shopping disorders and gambling disorders and trichotillomania, and, but especially severe OCD and even people with, uh, with addictions, like they, these are very, very helpful. So now we are, are able to accept patients who are on serious drugs and have have severe OCD and, and we are quite sure we can help them and make and give them a better quality of life. So that that's an example of new neuroscience giving us uh, nutrient therapies that that are, are far better than we had just just a few years ago. Now NMDA is interesting. I think a lot of people listening probably haven't heard of it. You might be saying, well I don't have OCD uh, or any of these other things. Uh, number one, you might have a little bit of it and not really realize it. I actually had meaningful amounts of OCD as a young man. Like I had stimming behaviors and facial tics and uh, things like that. It just uh, for instance, this is weird. I, I could not serve a volleyball to save my life unless I bounced it three times. I do not know why. <laughs> All I know, I couldn't do it, right? Bounced it three times, I'd nail it. The rest of the time, it was like, why even try? And a bunch of other just strange things that as I repaired my brain and got my neurotransmitters working and all, I'm like, wow, I don't have that anymore. Like I, I don't sit there and, and count all the time and do all these l weird little things that you might not even see unless you're a trained uh, psychiatrist or neurologist to go, oh, that's a weird, you know, that's a weird nervous system. Uh, number two, a lot of the anti-aging drugs and some of the, the nootropics, the cognitive enhancers that I've been using for quite a while, they're NMDA receptor agonists or they, they, they change the NMDA thing. So if you want to live a long time, you want to raise your IQ, or you just want to run at the level that your body is designed to run, but may not be, NMDA is probably as important as some of these other neurotransmitters like acetylcholine that we've maybe all heard of, If at least if you've dabbled in nutrients, you've probably heard of that. Do you agree it's that important? Yeah, NMDA is where memory resides, the, the miracle of memory, and, and, and we're beginning to understand how one how one can actually uh, have memory. And there's something called memory extinction that resides in the NMDA. And that's what the problem that, that addicts and, and OCD people have. It's a matter of be, getting able to transition from one thing to another and sort of get rid of the memories you don't want to retain and, and actions you don't want to repeat. It's also where plasticity comes. We've, we've, people are really looking at plasticity to, to help the brain improve in many ways that's all in the NMDA receptor, and it's a, it's a, we're learning that it has everything to do with the neurons at the NMDA receptors, and, but also the partnership with glial cells. That, that's another major advance in neuroscience. We're now knowing that, um, that the glial cells are almost like another brain, and we have as many glial cells in our brain as we do neurons, and they collaborate in marvelous ways. And wow, is that leading to better and better understanding and better therapies? I, I'm so happy that you're talking about glial cells uh, because uh, in my, my last, or I guess two books ago, Headstrong, I went sort of deep on that. And I look at glial cells in a very simplistic way as being sort of the, the cells responsible for the immune system in the brain, but also for, for pruning synapses and for maintenance. And 
a lot of the the current uh, revolution in ketosis, it, it paralleled a lot of the early writing that I had done on ketosis as a state of high performance. And ketones feed neurons better than sugar does, better than glucose. Neurons will preferentially eat ketones. There's just one little problem. If you're in ketosis all the time, guess what likes glucose a lot more than uh, than ketones? It's your glial cells, right? So you can starve the glial cells if you never eat carbs. And this is why cycling in and out of ketosis might be good. Adding ketones like brain octane to your food, that's a good idea, maybe. At least I think it is. But the, the idea that you're going to never eat a carb again, <laughs> what's that no. going to do? I mean, you, you tell me, <laughs> Bill. Right. Zero carb diet is not a good idea. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we 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 evolved from the caveman, and 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 uh, and, and and of course, uh, to do something that radically changes that original diet that people had for millions and millions of years is not a good idea, because our body is adapted and, and to to that. And uh, the glial cells are really interesting because, first of all, that's where our brain cells come from. Neurons come from glial cells. And we, I've often wondered, uh, we have these 80 billion brain cells, and yet they're being nourished every day. Nutrients come in and, and trash leaves. Well, guess how it happens? Well, the glial cells do that. The glial cells, especially the astrocytes, which are a form of the glial cells, they've got end feet that wrap around our blood capillaries, and, and they have gap junctions, and there's a, a, a really great uh, uh, system whereby the nutrients from your blood flow through those glial cells right into the neurons. And, and the, the microglia, the form of glial cells that are tiny, well, those are the ones that, that, that are the uh, immune system, and they also the, are the trash collectors and the garbage collectors that get the junk out of the brain. And then you got the, the oligodendrocytes with this funny name, and they're the guys that make the myelin sheath. And um, it's just a... It's, the, they have to rewrite the neuroscience books. I just bought a book called The Neuron, and it, it's a famous book. It's about the third edition, and it just came out, and I started reading it, and it's obsolete already. <laughs> it's obsolete. Uh, it's, it's so exciting. The field of, of, uh, of brain science is moving so fast. The, the disappointing thing, the disappointing thing is that, uh, uh, that it's not leading quickly into, into therapy. And it seems like all the research is still aimed at finding the next billion dollar drug that can help people. And uh, we now have enough knowledge that uh, from, from the new research, when you put it all together, we're, we're learning that uh, with nutrients uh, and, 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 and with diet even, we, we can make radical improvements in, in, in people with depression and anxiety and problems like that. And and that we don't necessarily need a, a drug because the problem with drugs is they're they're um, they're they're abnormal molecules, they're foreign molecules, and they're p powerful in your brain and they don't lead to normality. Well, uh, I I think that within 30, 40 years we'll have a society where uh, I don't I think drugs will be on the way out. We won't need them, and we'll learn how to normalize the brain. Are we going to be normalizing the brain using? Uh, lasers, electrical stimulation, neurofeedback, and uh, and some combination of of nutrients and food that's personalized based on genetics and epigenetics and uh, other things like that. Like, what what does the future look like? I'm asking because you have 30 years of yeah. experience. Your your lens is is more honed by wisdom uh, than the average person, and you also discovered that nutrient deficiencies are tied <laughs> to uh, emotional disturbances uh, and, and mental illness. So given your lens, you're probably the best guy I could think of to ask what, what it's going to look like in 20 years. Well, I have to say, I, I believe I see the future and it's a beautiful future. And I hope I live long enough to see the beginning of it. I think that the next big real breakthrough is going to be preserving the integrity of our DNA. I think that's going to be the really big thing. And, and when that, when we learn how to do that, we're going, we're going to, uh, I think that, that conditions such as autism, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, I think they're going to disappear from society. It might be that we won't be able to die unless we get hit by a truck. <laughs> or at least we might be, and I, I think lifespans will go, get into the 150 and 200 years, quality lifespans. Um, 
And now what you mentioned, the, 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 the techniques you mentioned, uh, I, I think are short term and, and they're going to be, I think they're going to be useful for the next five, 10, 20 years and they will help people. But they, they, we are, we now have the ability to, to change gene expression. See our, we have about 20,000 genes and they work for us all day, every day. I mean, we, people think of it as that's why I'm tall or why I've got blue eyes, but really our genes are, have the, have the code and the recipe and the blueprint for, for sending special proteins and chemicals and enzymes into our every cell in our body. And that system uh, tends to deteriorate with time. And, and that's why people age. Aging is nothing more than our DNA getting old and, and changing and deteriorating. We're learning how to protect the brain. The uh, three guys got a Nobel Prize about five years ago uh, because they, they worked out all the details on, G, on, on DNA repair. We have 30 trillion DNAs in our body. There's an enormous amount of information there, and it's vital to our health as much as anything. And um, we, the, every one of our DNAs is ripped apart and massacred every day between 10,000 and a million times a day, every one of our DNAs that are vital to our health is torn apart, ripped apart. And, and the, one, of the, one of the most remarkable aspects of human life is DNA repair. It's like we got every, every single tiny little cell we have, it's like we got a hundred or a thousand repairmen in there constantly fixing these breaks, including just ripping the DNA apart. It immediately goes back together. And this has led to a, a something that is truly exciting called CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Have you had any programs on CRISPR? Absolutely. We now have the ability to edit our genes. And uh, this is the, probably the fastest grown, uh, growing um, uh, technology I've ever seen in the field of mental health. Just five years ago, people were just talking about it. And they, they, they now have the ability... Uh, they, they, there are, there are uh, sort of fingerprints for every gene we have, and they're, they're developing what they call guy RNA, and, the, and there are companies making this and selling it and competing with each other already that you can put into the body, and it will go straight to the gene you want to affect. And they, they, they bind that to another gene that's called the scissors gene that cuts the DNA and separates out the gene which of course the body quickly puts back together. But of course what they do is they introduce a proper gene. And so they can take a defective gene, which might cause uh, you know, some, some nasty disorder for someone, uh, and, and they, they can change it, and put it a good one. Um, they, they started working with rodents and were successful in, in um, correcting severe illnesses in rodents with it. Then uh, about two years ago, they uh, started seeing data on, on chimpanzees, and that was very promising. Then they started working on human embryos in Europe and in China. And just two weeks ago, uh, there was a child born uh, using CRISPR to improve and to, and to uh, perfect a couple of genes that, that looked like that child was going to run into real trouble. So now we don't know for sure whether we can solve all the ethics problems. But we, they are able to, uh, for example, if a, per, if a woman has the BRCA gene and she's prone to cancer, they will be able to um, get rid of that, that, that defunct, dysfunctional gene and put in a proper one. Uh, that, I think, might become standard in 10, 20, 30 years. There's, there are already billions of dollars going into this field. Uh, that's kind of exciting. It's kind of scary, too. <laughs> But, and, and what we don't know is if it'll ever really be done safely because of what they call um, uh, the, 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 the off-target effects. Um, they, they're, they might want to be affecting one gene, but you don't want to affect another hundred and maybe screw things up and make things worse. But uh, yeah. that's just an example of how technology is moving. Um, but the, to me, I think that the... We, we know what healthy is, um, and uh, there, are, there, we're, there are diseases and conditions that I call epigenetic disorders. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and these include cancer, heart disease, schizophrenia, and autism, and bipolar, and a few others. And these are incredibly complex diseases. And they occur because of environmental insults, usually together with a, with a, a genetic predisposition. And, 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 uh, and, and it's an event. Cancer is really an event where, uh, where suddenly your DNA gets overwhelmed, usually by oxidative stress, excessive oxidative stress operating on the guanine part of your DNA, which is the, the weak link in your DNA. And it changes. It can change uh, dozens or hundreds of genes. And so then you have a condition like cancer. And when that happens, you then have a cancer stem cell that nobody can get rid of. And uh, anyhow, we're understanding exactly why this happens. And uh, I think what it's really leading to more than anything is prevention. I really believe prevention. We're going to learn how to pre. We're, we're learning more and more about the predisposition for these diseases. We know that so many of them are involved oxidative stress. We are all, we all have a dozen or so really great natural chemicals like glutathione and you know, and catalase and others that that protect us against oxidative stress. We're, we're, we have cosmic radiation and environmental insults all the time. And some people, so these are genetically expressed protectors. We have an army of protectors. Some people are born with weakness in that. They're born with a uh, weak weakness. They might may, may not be able to make enough glutathione, for example. And I'm one of those, by the way, which is why I manufacture a glutathione supplement and I take a lot of it. <laughs> it, it just seemed like in my self-interest, plus it helps a lot of other things too. Like if you're going to have alcohol, you might want to have some glutathione present to detox it, right? <laughs> you're, you're trying to make yourself bulletproof. Uh, you you called it. <laughs> it's it's interesting because uh, you are one of the the game changers who made it into my book Game Changers and law well, twenty you. law twenty eight and the game changers are people who've done really big things you know to to change the world just achieve at the top of their field and the law that that I cite your research in is uh, law twenty eight it says if you get toxins only from nature you get nutrients only from food like if 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 that's how the world worked. And the, the broader way of saying that is you evolved in a clean environment to feel great and live long enough to reproduce as long as you had enough high quality food. Those days are gone. High performance now requires that you overcome the decline of clean air, food, and water by going beyond what you get from eating even the most nutritious food. The highest yep. performers use supplements to perform better now and live longer too. Take your vitamins. Now, the the part of the reason I'm, I'm bringing that out is you're talking about epigenetics, you know, the study of how environment changes DNA. But everyone listening to the show now, we're breathing air that has stuff in it that that was never there before we put it there. We're eating That's food right. that has artificial molecules like glyphosate and has less nutrients and all of that. Do you still stand by your we're going to live to 150 to 200 years given the decline in food quality, soil quality, air quality, water quality, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. And the reason so is I, I, think, <laughs> I think we can sharpen our protection against those nasty guys. Uh, we, we know what the protectors are. And most of them are genetically, they're, they're, some of them are, are things that you can give uh, nutritionally, but some of them also, and some of the nutrients can affect gene expression that can really sharpen our defense. And so I think, I, yes, it's like a war. And yes, we do have increasing yeah. amounts of nasty guys trying to hurt us, but I think we could, we could strengthen our defenses. So, so what are some things that people listening today might do in order to strengthen their defenses, given what we know? Most of us won't CRISPR edit our DNA, at least for no, a few but, years. Uh, if you're thinking about doing that and you're listening, uh, think twice. But if you decide to do it, <laughs> tell me about it. I want to know. <laughs> Right now, it's more it's yeah. more of a dream than a reality. You're right. It, it but there, well, what can we do now? Well, the first thing is to recognize that is that every human being is biochemically unique. And uh, for for many years, I thought the biggest problem was deficiencies, and it was just a matter of finding out what you're low in and providing these really important nutrients that you're missing. But well, one of the, probably the first thing I learned that really surprised me in working with hundreds of and then later thousands of, of patients was that the greatest mischief is caused by nutrients that are in overload. Right. And, and things like, like copper. Uh, 
like <laughs> copper. Yeah, if you we we have a beautiful system that's supposed to regulate copper in our body. So even if you choose chewed on a copper bar, you'd be normal in your bloodstream. But if you can't do that and your copper escalates, that's why people get postpartum depression, causes anxiety. It's associated with with violent behavior, mental illness. Gray yeah, so, hair. <laughs> so for what we do at our clinic, and, and by the way, I have a team that travels around the world training doctors how to do this. It's one of our best programs. We now have uh, 630 doctors, psychiatrists, medical doctors that are now evaluating patients with severe problems, what might be anxiety or depression or a behavior disorder. And we're, we're learning what what their individuality is. And we're learning how to showing the doctors how they can normalize uh, these chemistries and these chemical imbalances and these brain imbalances with nutrients. And uh, we're, we're uh, going to have, we, we're going to have our next uh, training program in April, late April of uh, 2019, right here in the Chicago area. That's and, through the, uh, the Walsh Research Institute. Yes, and okay. uh, and it's it's a really a growing and a popular program. We we've also done more than three hundred doctors in Australia. We've had programs around. It's it's just growing and growing. Our most enthusiastic doctors, by the way, are psychiatrists. They're, they're not yeah. as a group. They're not the happiest uh, group that I I run into. I, I just came from the American uh, Association of, um, Psychiatric Association annual meeting with eighteen thousand psychiatrists and. Uh, that what's happened is they, they go to medical school all these years and learn all kinds of important stuff. And, and then a patient comes in maybe with a schizophrenia or depression and they, they spend their 30 minutes, which is about all they're allowed by insurance, wondering what drug am I going to give them? Mm. So the psychiatrists that we see, uh, we, we show them how when a patient comes in for the first time with a serious problem, they can do some blood studies and do some very careful um, medical history and they can identify um, which neurotransmitters are misbehaving, and we can show them how to how to fix it with nutrient therapy, sometimes together with with drugs. We're not we're not opposed to 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 um, you know medication, uh, which are now called biologics. That's supposed to be a softer name than a psychiatric drug. Um, <laughs> But we, we, we show them how sometimes uh, uh, severe problems can be corrected without having to use a drug. And sometimes we can show how drugs can be enhanced. We can also, our testing can show them and guide them to which drugs are the right ones to give to people. Like we know that there are some, some young teenagers who, if, they, if you give them an antidepressant, they're likely to become uh, suicidal or even homicidal. And that seems to be the reason why we've had school shootings are people in a Teenagers who inappropriately have been given the wrong drug. Um, so anyway, uh, the I think the we're, we've made a lot of progress, but the future I think is really bright. And it's it's and I, there are these literally thousands of really wonderful neuroscientists around the world making advance after advance. The only problem is they don't seem to talk to each other. <laughs> and there and 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 uh, there's little pieces of information here and there. Uh, about four years ago, I got really frustrated about bipolar disorder. And the main reason is I didn't understand it. I had more than 1,600 patients that I saw with, my do with our doctors with bipolar, but I didn't understand it. And, and that when I wrote my book, I had a chapter on schizophrenia, on, on autism, on behavior disorder. I did not have a chapter on bipolar. I didn't think I knew enough about it to write a chapter. So I decided to delve into it, and I, I spent years studying neuroscience around the world. And guess what I found? I, I believe I have discovered exactly what it is. There's all these mysteries of bipolar that, that have plagued people for more than 100 years. For example, people don't understand why, why it's a, a late onset disorder. It usually comes after the age of 16. And it often comes suddenly. And once a person develops bipolar disorder, it doesn't go away. It's there as a problem to challenge the rest of their lives. And why, for heaven's sakes, do they suddenly start with mania? Why does the mania get worse early on? And then why do they cycle or why do they switch between mania and then sort of an opposite co condition of depression? After several years of doing this, I think it's all right there. The neuroscientists have that the answers. And we have, uh, I believe, we have solved all the mysteries of bipolar, and we now know exactly what it is. 
and I'm, I'm writing a book on it. And I, I went to the annual meeting of the, of the APA, the world's, you know, the big meeting of the world's psychiatrists. And I presented this in a new research section. And uh, I was really disappointed. Nobody seemed to care a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a psychiatrist would come up to me and say, well, this is really interesting, but I've got this patient coming next week who's got bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia. Um, how is this going to help them? Well, the answer is no. Uh, we, what we've, we now understand what causes it. We know the mechanisms. And, and this should lead directly to far better therapies. Are you are you allowed to say? Give a give me the layperson's view of what's causing well, I, bipolar. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, and basically, it's what what it amounts to is that our our brain neurons are remarkable little guys. They uh, we've got these eighty billion of them. They can they have a remarkable ability to develop a high voltage called a potential. Psychiatrists yes. call it potential. And, and, and it's, it's, we have, you know, all of these billions of neurons, but if you took 20 of them and strung them together in series, you'd have enough for a flashlight battery. There's an enormous amount mm -hmm. of really high potentials. And, and there are about three or 400 genes that collaborate to enable that potential. So um, that's, that's critical to brain function and to li living. What we found is that uh, the, the cause of bipolar is when local parts of the brain lose the ability to form complete voltages. So it's an electrical problem in the brain. Yeah, caused by uh, some combination of, of these hundreds of genes that are needed to, to make that voltage. And so what happens is that um, when, when the voltage drops, the neuron becomes hyperactive. When, when neurons fire, uh, some chemicals rush in, some ions rush into the neuron and some rush out. The ones that rush out are potassium ions. Well, the potassium and, and, the, and the sodium ions rush in, and that's how, that's how brains work. And uh, what the, the interior of a neuron, the, not, it's not a problem of clearing out the excess uh, Sodium, in fact, uh, they, they call it a, a drop in the ocean. It's really not hard to do. The problem is getting rid of the, the potassium that's outside the neuron. And so it tends to collect and it can flood in certain parts of the brain. And when, that ha and when, when you have, when, when, the, when the potassium outside the neuron collects, the voltage drops additionally. So those parts of the brains get to the point where they, the, it gets more, you get more and more hyperactive, more and more manic, and then you get to a point where it shuts down. It seems to include the area called the Rafe, the Rafi nuclei, which is what makes serotonin. So the serotonin supply in the brain shuts down rather quickly. And uh, so that's why they go into, a, a, into depression. It, it, it's a channelopathy. It has to do with ion channel movements and, and being able to, because that's where the voltage comes from. It comes from the voltage gradients inside and outside. So that's basically it. Uh, and if, if that sounded uh, really technical for you listening to this. And uh, I apologize. Read, no, no, no need to apologize. <laughs> I think that, that was a great description. It's a complex thing. I would just say read, read Headstrong. Uh, the book uh, that I wrote where I describe mitochondria in your brain, they're what's making that voltage uh, potential. Yep, exactly. And so, all right, so a lot of people, okay, maybe you have a little bit of this going on, uh, even if you know, you're know you not bipolar, but but a lot of us have some problems with the electrical potential in our brains. I, I think it's, well, 48% of people under age 40 have uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and everyone over age 40 has some of it, um, unless they're doing radical things like I am. Uh, and maybe I still have some too. I probably do given my 300 pound of, of former obesity and my health history. But is this something that you could solve just by having more salt? I mean, sodium potassium no. ratios seem pretty important. Un I mean, just <laughs> un unfortunately, no. Uh, basically, <laughs> it's hard to fight an enemy if you don't know who it is. If you don't know who an enemy is or what it is, it's really hard to combat it and fight it. I think what our our contribution is that we now unveiled what it really is. We've, okay. I think we've now disclosed what it is. 
And I think it's going to take researchers and, and clinicians. I think it's going to lead to greatly improved therapies. We even know why lithium works. I mean, it, it, there are about eight or nine theories of why lithium helps some bipolar patients. And these are all plausible theories, but we I think we know why it really works. And uh, so it really helps to have that kind of an understanding. Um, I, I do believe that the real answer will be in prevention. And the reason is we now understand why bipolar strikes and why it strikes uh, late onset and like in, 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 in we all, I think we already have lab tests that can identify people who are about to become bipolar. And we know how with nutrient therapy to prevent it. So I think what that's, are, that's what's coming, I think. What are the nutrients that work when it's about to happen? Primarily antioxidants. Uh, See, what, what happens is that the weak link in your DNA, for some people who are predisposed to this problem, is the guanine. Well, we have 30 trillion of these uh, uh, DNAs containing that. That's one of the four nucleotides that make up DNA. And, and when that starts to deteriorate, it shows up in the bloodstream. There are blood tests you can do right now. And I, I think in the future, when a guy goes in for uh, a, a checkup, they're going to check his guanine level because if, if it gets high, that means, wow, you're on the verge of an epigenetic disorder. Wow. Of a permanent disorder in which is going to involve many genes suddenly doing the wrong thing. And that's where, what cancer is. It's what most of heart disease is. It's what schizophrenia is. It's what autism is. I think we're going to learn how to prevent every one of those disorders. I think they're going to disappear from society. It's going to take a while. I, I, I am fully agree with your assessment there. And when you say that, though, probably... 80% of the normal population and only 50% of Bulletproof Radio listeners hear that and go, you're crazy. Uh, and uh, th there's actually a couple other laws and game changers about dealing with critics and, and people who, who do the things that change the world uh, somehow just don't worry about the naysayers and say, well, you know, hey, here's the data, here's the facts, uh, this is going to be what it is. When you say a statement like that, do you have a little voice in your head that says, oh, people aren't going to believe me? Or are you uh, just old enough and wise enough that you just don't care? Well, the first thing I do is I ask myself, could I be wrong? Yes. I have, I have to do that first. And, and, yeah. and, but uh, after, but after, after uh, many, many years of having you know, experienced different ideas, uh, I'm, I'm quite confident this is what's going to happen. And really, all I want to do is speed up the process. Yes. There's so much human misery out there. I, I really would like this to to you know become available earlier. When we talk about antioxidants, I, I mean, I, I do some really radical things. I I started out way coming from behind in terms of arthritis in my my teens, uh, and a lot of what I would term the diseases of aging, or at least things like them, uh, before I was thirty. And I, I've gotten rid of most of them, but I'm a a huge fan of, of using ozone therapy. And ozone naturally turns up your cells' ability to make their own antioxidants inside the cells. Things like SOD and catalase, which you mentioned earlier. Yep. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm flying a lot or I'm particularly uh, biologically stressed, I actually supplement with SOD and catalase, which you really can't take orally. They don't work very well. SOD you can get in a little bit, but catalase gets destroyed in the gut. Are you doing that, be are you doing that because of the uh, increased cosmic radiation? Increase a lot higher radiation. up there. It, it, it's a lot higher up there. It, that is the a big part of it. And I take a bunch of our, our eye armor, a supplement I make that's full of uh, a bunch of things that are protective, uh, massive doses of astaxanthin, lutein, uh, zeanthanine, other things like that, and a bunch of mitochondrial things like uh, one we make called Keto Prime. It's a, it's a part of the Krebs cycle. And I feel better when I land. I'm less puffy yeah. when I land. My brain still works when I land which is pretty objective evidence that something I'm doing works. Uh, so I figure by increasing my natural antioxidant capacity, taking my polyphenols, my antioxidants, uh, and uh, you know, get doing intravenous glutathione after I land when I can, I'm able to travel at a way that, that is biologically destructive if you don't have these things at your, at, your, at your disposal. And I would say the healthier thing would be to do that stuff and not fly as much as I do, but I feel like by flying around and giving talks to large groups of people and educating about these things, I'm, I'm helping a lot more than I'm harming. So I, I think, I think that, uh, antioxidant therapy is going to become mainstream. 
we, we now have vitamin D is mainstream. I think that uh, soon we're going to have zinc and, uh, and all kinds of antioxidant therapies. That's going to be a mainstream thing, and it's going to really benefit so many people. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow down aging. It's going to help prevent a lot of diseases. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that that's, what's, that's what the future is, I believe. One of the things that, that is of concern to me, and there's some pretty good studies out there that show, uh, I think the technical term is willy-nilly use of antioxidants. It, it reduces uh, the beneficial impact of exercise. Because you you never get the oxidative wave that comes from lifting heavy things or sprinting, and because the antioxidants you took orally took away the pro oxidants, like, like a brief exposure to high oxidative stress, like with ozone therapy, causes your cells to get healthier. Yeah. Are you concerned that that you know chronic use of antioxidants uh, without an opposing force might have negative effects? Well, I'm 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 absolutely certain that exercise is going to continue to be essential to everybody. Um, I'm not, no, I'm not. I think, I think that's a good question, but I, I don't, I don't worry about that. I don't worry about that. And, 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 and even if, even if that was a real threat to well being, I think you could, you could alternate, couldn't you? you could. That, yeah. That's what I do. Actually. I, I don't, I don't overwhelm myself with antioxidants every day. Uh, and sometimes I intentionally expose myself to more oxidants. It's the chronic ones or having a pollutants in your body, like heavy metals, th- things that are creating just free radicals. Uh, having glyphosate incorporated into your collagen matrix because you still eat industrial animal products instead of pastured ones. I think things like that that are chronic are just horribly destructive. But you know, occasionally telling your cells, if you can't make antioxidants, could you just die already and make some fresh cells that can make antioxidants? That that seems like a good strategy. <laughs> it does, and 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 uh, some people simply don't make enough natural antioxidants, yeah. and they're the ones who die young and develop all kinds of diseases. And I I, I think that. Good. The good news is nutrient supplements can can do can do that job for us. Uh, I I think that at this point, uh, it, if you're in a position to be able to listen to a podcast, which puts you in rarefied air uh, amongst all humans on the planet, <laughs> yeah, um, that you probably ought to be taking your basic supplements. Uh, you know, if you're not getting your magnesium and, <laughs> and things like vitamin D, uh, vitamin A, uh, vitamin K, and uh, uh, Certainly, the right forms of vitamin E, probably the gamma form. Uh, it <laughs> you're you're just missing on a low hanging fruit that has a high likelihood of being beneficial, but isn't terribly expensive compared to any of the bad effects of not having those. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? It sounds like you would, but almost, almost. I, I agree with it with respect to certain nutrients. Okay. but there are some nutrients that can cause mischief. Ah, like and, which ones? In some people, for for example, folates. Yes. Folic acid, vitally important. However, uh, if a person has uh, has uh, low serotonin depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or a movement disorder, it'll make them worse. Supplements of that will make them worse. So there are there is a handful, maybe six or eight nutrients you have to be really careful of. Uh, but in general, what I, I agree with what you said in general, with a, few, with a few of these exceptions, you also would not want to do any methylation therapies on people who are born with overmethylation. 8% of Americans are born genetically with too much methylation. So you wouldn't want, they, they would be, uh, they could be harmed by things like methionine or SAMI. And these are, whereas people who have too little methylation capability, that would be like mother's milk for them. It's, it's uh, one man's meat is another man's poison. So um, I've got a lot of people coming to me saying, gee, what would be a really great uh, uh, multivitamin? And I think it depends on their individual chemistry. Uh, um, what most people who get, get nutrient, uh, pro, uh, n- nutrient supplements, uh, broad-based ones, they are probably getting, uh, they're probably getting five or six or seven that are really essential and would, they would benefit from having more of it. But there might be a couple that, that uh, would tend to make them worse. And, and yeah. so um, I think that's going to be, um, that, that I think is going to become commercial, by the way. I think people are going to be able to develop quickly the ability to do inexpensive lab testing that might cost less than $100, find out who they are biochemically. And I think people are going to start marketing and selling um, selling this, uh, I once developed a system where we typed people and put them into 26 different types, A through Z, with, with different inborn tendencies 
So uh, to identify which nutrients they needed to emphasize, which ones they needed to suppress. And I, I think that's going to be something that somebody's going to develop and make a lot of money on. You know, <laughs> I've talked to several startups uh, working on doing that. In fact, maybe 15 years ago, I registered a URL called like vitamintests.com or something like that. And, and dug in on this. And a lot of people probably don't know this. I, I also helped to start one of the first direct-to-consumer lab testing companies uh, in, in the U.S., uh, where the idea is, hey, it's your data. You should be able to get your data, do what you want with it. You can give it to your doctor or not, but it's your data. And the I like that, by the way. I really like that approach. It, it's, I think it's just part of a basic human right. Like you should be able to know what's going on without having a permission slip to, to be allowed to know what's going on in your body. The, the problem, though, is interpreting the results can become relatively complex, but now we have AI and machine learning and I, the, the stuff I'm seeing uh, out there, some of it unreleased come from startups. It, I have great hope that we'll be able to say, all right, here's what you should do. And we will find what you're saying is that there's, there's clusters. I, I like your number 26. That's probably going to cover 80% of the market. The, the problem is that if you're one of those people like me, I'm probably a biological outlier uh, on, on a whole bunch of different ways. Just In fact, I would go beyond probably because I know my genetics and I've talked to some of the you know, top geneticists in the world going, oh, that's interesting. You know, are, are you really human or not? And, uh, um, you might need a, you might need a, might need a thousand types to pick you up. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so, but you can be an outlier, but here's the thing. Even if you were to, to take, say one of those 26 types, you're probably going to be way better off as a human being, even if you're not perfect, than if you were to just say, I'm going to go take, you know, this big mix of, of nutrients. Uh, and, and it's, it's one reason if you go to my vitamin cabinet, you don't see a lot of multivitamin kinds of things. What you see is no. uh, there's some targeted formulas like this is exactly a, you know, a poly, there's 10 polyphenols. One of the things I manufacture, 10 different polyphenols in one thing. So if you need polyphenols, you're probably going to get the right ones. Uh, but I, I have a, just a basic problem. Same thing with some of the, the nootropics out there saying, Oh, we're going to put together, you know, 30 different, uh, things I'm like, well, some of those racetams, help some people and they hurt others, how would you ever exactly. know until you try the individual ingredients? So I would, I would encourage people listening, get tests, get your genetic tests, get lab tests, you look at red blood cell nutrient levels. If you can be data-driven, great. If not, try. You can try, try it. Yeah, try five or you six things it. for a month. If you feel better, cool, but, but do things that are clustered to have the effect you want. Yes, you're going to spend a day on Google. You're going to read blog posts and, and things like that. Invest $100 on, on getting three or four different supplements. Uh, one mindset, and it's kind of a long question for you, but one mindset that I started with was I'm only going to test one thing at a time. And I realized there's more things that exist than I have months in my life to try them. That's right. So, so I started saying, I'm going to try the things that all push this pathway in the same direction to see if I get a result. And then I can stop taking some of them. Do you like that that kind of what I call a pragmatic, multifaceted approach? Or are you a single nutrient at a time kind of guy? I'm not. Uh, um, and I, I think if you did every lab test you could do, you wouldn't have a drop of blood left and you wouldn't, <laughs> and you wouldn't have any money left. Yes. Uh, you have to, you have to prioritize. And, and with respect to supplement combinations, I think, I think targeted uh, su supplement formulations are a great idea yeah. for athletic enhancement, for muscle development, growth, uh, anxiety. I think that that's a great thing. I just don't like, I don't approve of the multiples that are one size fit all for everybody. So I think we agree on that. Okay. Um, so um, I, I think we're this is moving uh, rather quickly. I I believe you may you may have good statistics on it, but I believe that the number of uh, Americans who are taking nutritional, you know, really interested in nutrition and taking nutritional products is isn't that higher than thirty percent by now? I I believe it is. Who are taking at least yeah. one supplement a day, and and part of me is a little bit horrified. One of the most common supplements out there is calcium. <laughs> if you want to calcify your arteries in your brain, that's a really good strategy. At least for God's sake, take some magnesium with your calcium and maybe some vitamin K2 to keep yeah. the calcium where it goes. It's a vitamin D. Yeah. And it's, it's like if you do just one thing and, and you're not educated and you, know, you went to your favorite drugstore and picked up a bottle or something, man, th there's risk in doing it without any guidance. You, we know that, that we we know that undermethylated people are tend to be calcium deficient, and they need to have calcium together with magnesium and vitamin K. But people who are born with overmethylation can can harm themselves with with they already have more than they need. So yeah, it's individual. And, and so I could see listening to this and saying, you know what, 
I'm just going to throw up my hands. I'm either going to just take a, a multivitamin sandwich, I, like I hope it's good, or to heck with that, I'm just going to have a piece of chocolate cake. Uh, so at, how is one, per, one person who doesn't have $1,000 to spend on lab tests and carefully doing a bunch of stuff, let, let's, let, let me put it this way. You're on a budget. You have 50 bucks a month to spend on supplements to make yourself okay. uh, function better. How would you possibly prioritize that without lab tests? Well, hopefully the person uh, you're talking about is reasonably intelligent and has a computer and knows how to use it. Those and are the, what I would do... <laughs> those are the listeners what I would, of the show. All right, you, you got and, all and, li <laughs> and listen to podcasts like <laughs> yours and others and, 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 and try to identify maybe the five or six or the 10 most promising nutrients that might help them and then to try them one by one and see if, if it really makes a difference in their life. Um, if you don't have the money, if you, if you, it, the ideal would be to go to a doctor who understands this and, can, and you can spend maybe $1,000 finding out who you are. And, and, and if you have a serious problem like schizophrenia or bipolar or severe depression, I, I think you need to go to a doctor. Or not, you may not want to, you know, as they say, do this at home. But uh, if you don't have the money, you have to do the best you can. And I, I would uh, try to identify the most promising possibilities and do them as a trial. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's really good advice, and it does require a little bit of self-confidence. And here's the thing. If you were to go out and do that, you might screw something up. But if you don't do that and you continue eating whatever the heck it is you eat, you're already doing the same thing. You just did it without any knowledge of what's going in. So e either way, you're putting something in your body. Maybe you can increase the odds of what you put in your body doing the right thing for you with just a little bit of research. And that's been the foundation for me that, that helped me turn that, that corner from weighing 300 pounds and having a brain that didn't work. <laughs> I, th I think we should all try to find out who we are, who we are yeah. nutritionally. I, I love that advice. If there was one lab test that you could suggest for people, the first lab test to get, what would it be? Um, is this a healthy person or a person with a serious problem? Uh, let's call it a healthy person. At least, at least someone who would, would say, I'm, I, I don't have any serious problems. I, th things are kind of okay. And, and that's, that's most of us. I would start with plasma zinc. Interesting. Plasma okay. zinc. And the reason is that so many Americans are low in zinc. It has so much to do with, with, with health and, and with biochemistry and brain function and physical function. Um, I've learned that the average person who comes to our, cl our, our clinical processes, and I've now investigated more than 30,000 of them, the, the median zinc level of those people is 76 micrograms per deciliter, which is really low. Every one of those people would be better off and healthier if they, if they normalize their zinc. Now, many people get all the zinc they need from their diet. Many people get the zinc they need from supplements, um, but... I, I think if you're going to do one test, I would do a zinc test because if you're if you're low in zinc, that means your chance of getting cancer, chance of becoming uh, uh, de developing dementia, chance of developing heart disease is much greater. And I, I think it's just um, I, I would guess that probably half of Americans would benefit from more zinc. And so if you can only do one test, it'd be good to find out if that if you have that problem or not. And that's a very affordable test too. Yeah, uh, we back when we first started the clinical work, uh, labs used to charge us eighty bucks for that test, and then after uh, then after we we started getting high volumes, uh, we began to negotiate with lab companies, and then at one point we were able to get uh, zinc, copper, and 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 lead for twenty dollars for all three, and they were still making a profit on it. Uh, yeah, I think it's an inexpensive test. Um, probably less than $50. Plasma zinc, not, not serum zinc, plasma zinc. And, and we know what healthy is. It's between 80 and 120 micrograms per deciliter. And, uh, and that's where people should be. If you, want, if you want to be as healthy as you can possibly be. Uh, that's fantastic. I definitely supplement with zinc. And there's a bunch of different forms. And I ended up putting together one of the Bulletproof supplements which has zinc orotate with a smaller amount of copper orotate. And th the idea there is I, I did for several years take relatively high zinc levels to correct a deficiency that's tied to uh, one of the genes that I have. Uh, the problem was I ended up suppressing copper, just the ratio of zinc to copper got so much that I started, my hair started turning gray. 
which is a sign of lack yeah, of copper. Uh, so I added the, a little the, bit of copper in. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that knowing you and having met you before and talking to you and knowing a bit about you and reading your books, I would give you about a 20 to 1 odds that you're undermethylated. Uh, that would be Under, accurate, yep. Undermethylated people, I've now I've now tested and and studied uh, thousands and thousands of them. As a group, they tend to be low normal in copper, and so I think you were born with a tendency to be low low normal in copper and undermethylated. So uh, if you took and and say you needed zinc, you would unfortunately be driving your copper level too low. So yep. I think that that's uh, I understand that, and we see people, and so there are people that need zinc and we have to give them some copper too. There are other people who are copper overloaded and we have to give them zinc and make sure they don't get copper. It's quite individual. It, it is very individual and it, and it, it I'd, I'd prefer to have, you know, one, one or the other. And when you're saying, right, how do you help the broadest number of people who are only going to take one supplement? Um, there's also this question of you, do you have zinc, or sorry, do you have uh, copper in, in your serum versus red blood cells versus everywhere else? And what we're starting to find is, is fascinating. You can take a nutrient, whether it's, it's a certain type of fat, whether it's an essential one or not, or you could take a certain kind of nutrient, but where it goes in the body might be yeah. individual as well. And, like, like people wouldn't know this. You can have a diet of only monounsaturated fat, and it will not change one degree the amount of monounsaturated fat in your membranes in your brain, but it'll change the amount of monounsaturated fat greatly in your adipose tissues and the fat you store. So even yeah. then, you eat it, but it your body moves stuff around. How do you know that when someone takes uh, copper or zinc or anything else, where it goes in the body? Do you think we know enough about that? Not as much as we need to know, okay. uh, and and not certainly not as much as we need to know. And uh, the the and then of course the brain is separate, and the uh, that, that's a, almost a, a separate system. So it, it depends, uh, and also your GI tract. Sometimes the, the biochemistry of your GI tract is different from the rest of the body. But um, what, what we do know, we, we, do, we know some things. We know what the healthy level is in, say, plasma or zinc, or I'm sorry, plasma or your bloodstream and, uh, and in your urine levels. So we do have some lab tests where we, we can identify problems. Um, now, there are many different ways of testing a person. There are, there are nine ways, for example, of determining a person's zinc level. And um, plasma, a, a whole blood, uh, you know, and, 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 and even, even a taste test. Are you familiar with the taste test for zinc? Yes. That's, that's explain every, it, yeah. every, every five years uh, or so, the zinc experts of the world get together and they try to identify the best test that will identify uh, normality or a healthy level of zinc, and they they have a like there's like nine different tests you could do. The one on the very bottom is the taste test, because if you if you're zinc deficient, your taste is not is not very 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 ac accurate. Um, and right now, the the if if it's zinc, uh, we know that they they continue to say the plasma zinc is the best, but red pack cells is number two, and you get different information. Yeah, so the, there's still some. Uh, some mysteries out there. And what I'm most excited about for the future is that our ability to do correlative analysis with machine learning and artificial intelligence is so good. Pretty soon we'll be able to say, if your levels of this are high and your genes look like this, your levels of that will be low. We don't need to draw a lab test. And uh, yes. It's, yes, it's so cool. Uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Zak uh, was on. He spoke at, at one of the Bulletproof conferences. And uh, he basically said, look, in order to tell oxytocin, I can get this uh, from just testing electrical signals coming out in the brain or from heart rate variability. And in the data is so correlated with blood sticks, he's now drawing one third as much blood as they did five years ago, just because like, hey, it's predictable. We just never knew it before. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so excited that there'll come a day where you stare it at your, uh, at the camera on your phone <laughs> and run a little electrical current and say, oh yeah, now we know most of what we need to know about your labs. Uh, those days are coming, but that's probably like a 10 plus year kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I think technology is, is remarkably improving everything. And uh, the epigenetic, uh, the, the, I, I think genetics and epigenetics, uh, I think are, can really define a lot about a person's health. And uh, it's so incredibly complicated. We're going to need the cloud, and we're going to need information. You know, 
all, all this new technology. And but I, my guess is that this will happen. Maybe maybe it'll be like a Woody Allen movie where he steps inside a, a, a cubicle and and things happen, and then you walk out and you know everything about your body chemistry and what you need to do. Who uh, knows? I cannot wait for such a day. In the meantime, <laughs> we we have people like you and, and the doctors you trained. So you you said a minute ago, you said, well, Dave. Based on reading your books and talking to you, uh, you know you're probably undermethylated. And yeah, yes. of course you're right. How did you know that? Because you have 30 years of clinical experience. You're a walking yeah. correlation engine, and, and this is what all great doctors do. By the time they've been in practice for decades, like someone walks in the door, you're like, oh, I know what's wrong with that guy. Right? And of course, you have to do the dance, but you know. We, we, we had people that would walk into our clinic, and by the time they sat down in the reception area, we knew they had pyrrole disorder. Yeah, because they had the classic symptoms and traits. We were ninety five percent certain. I, I like to yeah. uh, the, you know, the, uh, the Matrix. We have that thing where Neo looks out one day and he sees everything as zeros and ones, and all of a sudden it's like like you know I I can see, and I think that clinicians who who are gifted and, and practiced develop that ability uh, to the point you can see things that that normal people just wouldn't see. And, and I've, I've met doctors. I've, I've now worked with so many doctors. There are some doctors who I call healers. They yeah. have some, I don't know if it's intuition or, or what, what it is, but they have the ability to, to look at it and, and, and get to learn everything about a, a patient, a human being, and they can home in on what's really important. Yeah. It's just a gift that some people have. It, it is a gift. I think some of those people are, are drawn to the medical profession and some of them become you know, body workers, energy workers, yoga teachers, yeah. whatever. But there are healers who are, are licensed professionals and there are some who aren't. But, and when you find a healer, you'll, you'll notice. <laughs> and uh, the more of those you know uh, who are your friends, uh, the, probably the better off you are, the longer you're going to live. Because I don't know how some of them know the things they know. Uh, sometimes I know a few things about people as well. But it's, it's a skill that I believe is teachable and is trainable. And we're going to have systems that help us do that. So... I Even so. if you don't have friends like that, or you don't have a doctor who's who's also a healer, uh, that doctor will have the tools that allow them to be a better healer. Which I'm, makes yeah, me happy. Their, their 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 waiting rooms are very full, and but they should try to spend as much time as they can showing others how to do it. Other doctors. Now, we're coming up on the end of the show, and we've talked about how you think it's going to be possible for us to live to 150 or 200 years old, which makes me happy because my goal is right in the middle of that, at least my, my minimum goal. Now, you, you've been practicing for a very long time, and Ray Kurzweil and people like that are saying, you know, there's an escape velocity. If you can just keep yourself young long enough, the technologies are going to come along. And here's, here's my question for you, a question I've asked uh, every, everyone I've interviewed in the last dozen or so interviews. How long do you think you're going to live with a highly functioning brain. Well, of course, I'm, I'm not uh, happy about the prospect that someday I may, my brain may turn to graham crackers. Um, <laughs> gluten my, ones, I, right? <laughs> uh, I'm half German and half Irish. My uh, German people die young. The, the Irish side of my family lives forever. My, my, I have an aunt uh, who lived to be 109. Wow. And she was mentally sharp all the way. On her 100, when I was, she called me on my birthday when she was 109 years old. She sang me happy birthday. We talked about politics. We talked about the family. She knew everything. Wow. And I've got uncles and aunts who died around 100. So I, I'm hoping I got some of those genes. Um, but um, realistically, um, I, I think that um, we, we know there are there are, are tribes in in South America mountains that that uh, where you have pe the people who are 110 years old are out working in the fields and are and are fine. So we know it's possible for humans to be like that. Uh, if you if you're asked about me personally, I'd be happy with another 15 years. Another I'm pretty old. Years. Got it. Uh, and even with all the nutrient knowledge you have, you know the ability to balance your brain, the ability to manage all these things, you think you think 15 years. I don't know. I'm just happy with every day. All right. I, gra gratitude's great, but I, I would just encourage you because uh, if, I don't think you're done contributing yet. Uh, bump your number up a little bit. <laughs> I think I have reverse al Alzheimer's because I'm, I'm having trouble remembering things that happened 50 years ago. But when I study neuroscience and new things, it seems to stick faster than ever. Ah, so I, beautiful. <laughs> Well, keep studying, keep writing, uh, Dr. Walsh. Uh, I am truly a fan of your work. You've uh, you've done some things that really 
have alleviated massive amounts of human suffering and helped a lot of people who who felt like there was no hope. And uh, people who are under-methylated like me uh, definitely benefit from uh, from the knowledge that you brought forth. And I, I think there's there's a wave of of change that'll happen even in our penal system when we realize what happens if we fix the nutrients of the people who are incarcerated. And there's so much derivative work that'll come based on some of the original discoveries that you've made and are still making. So just keep it up. Well, we're, uh, we, we're a dedicated group. We're a public charity. We're not interested in money. We're interested in trying to help help the world. And we're going to do the best we can. And thanks for your, thanks for your help. Oh, you're so welcome. Your info, you're at walshinstitute.org. If people can find a list of the 600 and something uh, doctors that you've, you've trained in your techniques at the website. Yes, we have. And we have a lot of uh, YouTubes and podcasts and things. Hopefully um, people can learn about yours and, and all the others we've done. Uh, we've already had, uh, I think a couple of years ago, we got to the point where more than a million people had listened to uh, one, one of our uh, informational lectures. Uh, beautiful. Well, keep doing what you do, walshinstitute.org, and thanks again. Well, thank you, Dave. Good talking to you. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Find a doctor who's trained in nutrients who can give you some good lab tests and help you take the right supplements and eat the right foods and do the right things. That's one of the highest returns on investment you can get, which is why it's one of the laws in Game Changers. And if you're going to go to the doctor, you're going to need something to read in the waiting room. So there's a couple of books you should get. One of them is called Game Changers, where you can certainly read about that one law that has Dr. Walsh in it. You could also buy Dr. Walsh's book, which is called Nutrient Power. So bring both of those books to the waiting room. You'll really impress your doctor when you do that. And then after you read the books, go to Amazon and leave a review because guys like Dr. Walsh and me, we actually read our reviews. We care what you think. Thank you for listening and thank you for picking up both books.